It's another recast this week of some of my earlier, hard to hear episodes. Today, I revisit episode two with some small additions. Here's the original opener. A novel about the expectations of a hopeless romantic and maybe why it isn't always such a great thing to be in a committed relationship with said romantic. Love and starry-eyed optimism are destined for a sad death in this week's case, Gustave Flaubert's masterpiece, Madame Bovary. Welcome to A Case for Classics, the podcast where I try to talk you into reading, for fun, those works of literature that maybe you've come to associate with homework and book reports. They might exist on a master curriculum list somewhere, but that doesn't mean they aren't valuable as entertainment to the modern sensibility. I completely forgot that this was my second episode, and I'm really happy to be revisiting it because I really do love this book. One of the things that continually sticks with me after having made a case for Madame Bovary and Gustave Flaubert are the assertions of many that it is the perfect book. I might have some objections to that, but even if it's slightly short of perfect, it's still a great work, full of some of the most amazingly complex characters that were being written at the time, and even today. As with these recasts, this will be a shorter episode because I hadn't yet hit my stride, but I hope you enjoy it. Madame Bovary was first published in serialized form in 1856. Gustave Flaubert, the author, is held even today in extremely high regard as a prominent French realist, Put a tab in the realist part. We'll come back to it in a second. Let's talk about the man himself first. Gustave Flaubert was born in 1829 in Rouen, France. He was a bisexual by his own admissions. Many have argued Flaubert's sexuality because in his lifetime, homosexual acts were considered an aberration. And since Flaubert was such a celebrated literary figure, there were many who refused to believe that someone who was held as an ideal, inspiring many of the greats who came after him, would never have engaged what was st- in what was stupidly believed to be deviant activities. We know better now. And if you want to maintain the uncertainty of his sexuality, because it is still debated, do so because of facts and not a desire to have great people fit into a weird mold. And it is weird, make no mistake. That's not how people work, and that's especially not how creatives like Flaubert work. And just know that there are plenty of facts out there that confirm that he was a bisexual. I'm bringing up his sexuality in the interest of representation. I think that it's important that modern LGBTQIA plus people know who was representing them in the past, and this guy is a good one to brag about. Okay, back to the realism part, and the man as the artist. To quote Wikipedia, I have no shame, (laughs) quote, Literary realism attempts to represent familiar things as they are. Realist authors chose to depict everyday and banal activities and experiences instead of using a romanticized or similarly stylized presentation. That sounds similar to how modern storytellers work, right? Well, Flaubert has long been held as the progenitor of modern writing, working in unsentimental, detached detail. I've seen many critics of Flaubert, and of the realist movement in general, complain of too much detail, too much lingering on mundane aspects of the scenery of the story. To that, I have to counter with a, um, do you not read modern authors? Really, how many times have you been really into a book only to have to wade through an author's love of the pattern on a couch? It's very common now, and I'll admit that it can sometimes slow the pace of a book, But it's about putting you in the story, you know? My point being, it's not as bad as some would have you believe. What's sort of funny about Flaubert as a writer is that although he was a realist writer, the authorial character that he embodied was a romantic one. Almost cliche, really. It was of the sullen, solitary writer, laboring to find that perfect word, that exquisite turn of phrase, and never being satisfied. I imagine him sitting among mountains of crumpled paper balls, thrown away in disgust, with splatters of ink all over his face as he dejectedly makes revision after revision. It's the tortured artist visual. 
Because of this desire for perfection, Flaubert's output was much lower than those of his contemporaries. He was a slow writer. British essayist and critic Walter Pater called Flaubert the martyr of style. Obviously, that's a jab, but I can't help but wonder if Flaubert didn't find that title a little amusing, because it is rather apt. Vladimir Nabokov said of Flaubert, much later and more flatteringly, quote, The legacy of his work habits can best be described, therefore, as paving the way towards a slower and more introspective manner of writing, end quote. So, we have the words of a contemporary in Pater, and the words of a student in Nabokov. I see them both as valid and true. We can have our cake and eat it too, albeit slowly. <laughs> Okay, now on to the book, Madame Bovary. When it was first serialized, the attention that it initially received was not good. It was accused of being obscene, and public prosecutors put Flaubert on trial. But as is often the case, the work grew in infamy because of all the hubbub. It went on to quickly become a bestseller. The main character of the book, Emma, is complicated. She's at once detestable and relatable. As I stated in the opener, she's a romantic with certain expectations for life and love that leave her constantly disappointed. She treats the people in her life as a means to fulfilling her lofty fantasies, and when she's left unsatisfied, she has a tendency to treat those people as disposable. Some of that can be attributed to youth, but that excuse can only go so far. In truth, Emma can be a bit of an inconsiderate jerk, and at the end of the book, you're left kind of feeling sorry for her husband. As usual, I'll avoid spoilers because, hey, pick up the book and read it. But I don't think that I'm spoiling anything huge by telling you that Emma takes lovers after she's married. Unlike her husband, I don't have much pity for her lovers, and I actually end up giggling over how she treats them. Sure, she, it's not good how she treats them, but it's also a bit of justice. <laughs> One lover in particular feels much put upon because he feels that Emma is too demanding of him in their trysts. He doesn't like that she expects him to pleasure her. You heard me. He's whining because she wants to make sure that she <clears throat> gets hers too. So their meetings are more than just a pleasure ride for him. There's a particular scene in the back of a carriage and woo, he takes issue with that. <laughs> as a woman, I'm sorry, but that's funny. That guy needs to shut up and give as good as he gets. To those concerned, let me say that the love scenes in this book aren't anything terribly scandalous to the modern sensibility. So don't worry that I'm pushing you to read porn. Although, I happen to think that a bit of erotica is good for the circulatory system, and I would be happy to introduce you to a few writers of that craft, should you want to know. What's kind of amazing about Madame Bovary is that it's a first novel. A first. And it's long been held as a high watermark for literature. Some have been used, some have even used the word perfect to describe Madame Bovary, and that's not a compliment given, even in jest. Maybe that slow, exacting approach to writing had more to it than martyrdom, huh? Way to go, Gustav. I think you should give this book a try because it's evocative. You'll be frustrated, even angry with the main character. You'll have feelings about her misadventures and how sloppy she is in her life. You'll pity her husband, the doctor, especially at the end. Oh my God, especially at the end. But you know what? you'll pity Emma, the main character, at the end too. It's refreshing to read a book where the main character is a woman, but a complicated woman who has her head so far up her own posterior that she isn't able to see that she had more than she thought all along. Those romantic fancies of hers blinded her to the fact that her reality was every bit as romantic as the destructive things that she chased to the detriment of herself and those around her. I want to read you two quotes from the book, both referring to Emma, and they show her passion and her desires, but also her constant disappointment with her view of those desires always falling short. First, the passion. 
Love, she thought, must come suddenly, with great outburst and lightnings, a hurricane of the skies which falls upon life, revolutionizes it, roots up the will like a leaf, and sweeps the whole heart into the abyss. And now the disappointment. Everything, even herself, was now unbearable to her. She wished that, taking wing like a bird, she could fly somewhere far away to regions of purity, and there grow young again. Too often in classics, women are virgins, whores, or virtuous sacrificing mothers. Emma is none of those, and I think it's important to have stories like that out in the world. I think that it's important to read and reread those stories that are out there, or else they're forgotten, and the thought of that happening breaks my heart. This part makes me grumpy, but I'll bring it up anyway in case any of you are interested, but there was a movie made in 2014 titled Madame Bovary, starring Mia Wasikowska. Did I say that right? (laughs) I like her as an actress, but I'm not going to seek this movie out because movie adaptations tend to give me disappointed heartburn. Okay, and that basically marks the end of the original episode. The original post on the Case for Classics website doesn't have much in the way of show notes, so I'm going to put up the usual set of links for charities and good causes and leave it at that. Thank you again for listening. Again. (laughs) It's been fun revisiting these, and I'm glad to have you here with me as I do them. If you've read Madame Bovary, make sure to talk to me about it. Some of those steamy scenes are interesting, (laughs) but I keep thinking about how misplaced Emma's affections are how complicated she is, and how actually crappy she is to her husband. It makes for a compelling read, even in modern times. So give it a read and come talk to me about it. I don't know if two podcasts, a YouTube channel, and a life all about books has clued you into this or not, but I love talking books, so don't be shy. And that's the case for this week. I hope I inspired you to pick up a new book, If you'd like to hear more from me, I co-host a horror-related podcast called The Ghost Writers Podcast with authors Mary San Giovanni and Matt Wildeson. Find me on social media. The show has a Facebook page and a Twitter account. Just search for A Case for Classics. Do you have something nice to say? Get in touch. Acaseforclassics.com is the best place for that. I have no options for you if you have mean things to say, just please don't. Would you like to advertise on this podcast? Authors, I'm talking to you. Contact me about promoting your newest work, and I'll give you a good deal. Let's get the word out on all those wonderful works. If you enjoyed this show, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other streaming service you use. It would really help the show, and we could talk books to a bigger audience. A Case for Classics is written, narrated, and edited by me, Summer Cannon. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for another case next week. <laughs>